Hello, good evening, welcome. My name is Gregor Murray. I'm Executive Member for Climate Emergency at Working in Borough Council, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the first ever Climate Conversation. This is a pilot program. We've never done this before. Um, we uh, want, firstly want to say thank you to everybody for coming along, for joining us tonight. We really do appreciate you giving up your Tuesday evenings to come and listen to, um, to our panel and listen to our conversation. We've got a wonderful panel of experts ready to share with you their thoughts, their insights, their expertise um, on their own businesses, their carbon uh, reduction journey, their decarbonisation journey, and to answer some of your questions as well later on. But before we begin, I have a couple of bits of housekeeping that I have to do. So before I um, introduce our panel to you tonight, there's just a couple of things I've got to say. So first and foremost, because of GDPR, I have to tell you that tonight's climate conversation is being recorded and will be available to view using public channels uh, very soon. This is why we're asking everybody, if you're not one of the panelists, please keep your video and your microphones off. Um, that way you're unlikely to, to feature on the video if you don't want to. Um, and it also protects our bandwidth to make sure that we can keep the conversation going. We don't all cut in and out. The next thing is uh, throughout the evening, we have the chat function. Um, if everybody wants to just open that chat function up, it gives you the opportunity to ask us questions. The questions will be collated as we go along. We've got time for Q&A at the end. Um, all of those questions will be collated and I will put them to our panelists uh, later on as well. So please open up that chat function and please start writing in your questions as we go through the conversation. Um, throughout the evening we'll also be running some polls. Um, so just to ask for your thoughts, your feedback, your um, ideas in terms of some of the things that we're discussing. Um, it'd be really great if you can all interact with those polls as well. The concept of climate conversations is really straightforward. So what we wanted to do was bring together a group of like-minded people to discuss some of the topical issues and share some of their learnings from their decarbonisation journey. It's also an opportunity to help people, help small to medium-sized businesses to connect with us, Wokey and Borough Council, to connect with our climate plans, but also to put you in touch with some of the grants, some of the best practice, some of the skills and some of the partners that are available across Wokey and Borough to help you on your decarbonisation journeys as well. In a second, I'll ask the panel to introduce themselves properly, um, but just for, for information, I'm joined tonight by Tom McDonald, who works for Low Carbon Workspaces, 
by Sarah Hitchcock, who works for Enesco, and for uh, and by Amira Hashimi, who works for Fraser's Property. Now, before we hear from them, it's time for our first poll, which I believe will just appear on the screen um, miraculously. But the question is, how important should decarbonisation be for local businesses? Is it very important, somewhat important or not important at all? I'll give you a couple of seconds to to fill that out. uh, And then I will start with some proper introductions. Okay, Tom, I'll start with you. So Tom works uh, as a Berkshire project officer for low carbon workspaces. Now, Tom is hugely qualified to talk to us tonight. He's got a master's degree in climate change and sustainability. Tom, what's the role of low carbon workspaces in supporting small to medium sized businesses? Um, Yeah, so hi, yeah, I'm Tom. Um, Thanks for having me today. Um, So low carbon workspaces uh, role in helping to decarbonise is essentially we are a grant scheme. So um, we're a government funded grant scheme um, and we offer grants for businesses to reduce their uh, carbon emissions. And generally that is that. Um, done by reducing the energy uh, energy usage. There are other methods, and there are other methods of doing that that we can support. But vast majority of our applications are for projects to reduce energy consumption. Um, the grant scheme is for SMEs, so that they're small and medium sized enterprises, um, less than 250 employees, less than 50 million euros turnover, um, and uh, less than 43 million euros in um, assets. So that those sort of, they're the sorts of businesses that we're able to support through the grant scheme. Um, we can support projects like LED lighting replacements, uh, solar panels, insulation, heating upgrades. Um, they're the sort of energy saving aspects that I talked about. Um, and we can also do um, funding towards waste management because sending um, food waste, sending cardboard, wood to landfill has got a large carbon footprint associated with it. So we can help support projects to buy to buy um, machinery or equipment that will help facilitate management of waste. So, if you current if a business currently sends all their waste in mixed in a in a just um, mixed waste goes to landfill, they want to buy some balers so they can separate out cardboard and plastic. We can help support um, something like that. Um, and any any project really where we can really properly ascertain there will be a carbon saving. We can there will be scope one or two, so direct or um, to the to the business. We can help with those with those projects, and that's for capital capital purchases as opposed to um, revenue. Um, the grants are match funded, so we offer them at a ratio of two to one, two for the applicant and one to us, one, one from us, and that's grants between one and five thousand pounds. So it's a minimum project size of um, of three thousand um, pounds. We also help. We also provide advice to businesses on how they may be able to save carbon. So. They're not necessarily always aware of, of what they want to do. Often, when, majority of the time, we do get businesses coming to us with a project in mind that they want to help. They want us to help fund, but sometimes businesses will come to us not knowing what they can do, um, and so we offer um, site visits to to businesses. Um, since the beginning of the first lockdown, we've been doing those virtually, and that that has been working well. And actually, there's also a considerable saving of of carbon there because we're not having to travel to the business, um, and we can still get a good feel for for what's going on at their premises uh, through video through a video call. Um, we also work with suppliers in the industry. Um, so we have a supplier directory on our website, and we think that's important to, to understand um, the the industry and what um, where how things are looking. So if we if we have relations with LED suppliers, we know sort of what demand is looking like for LEDs, boilers, things like that, solar panels as well. Um, we also think it's important to help that industry. If you're gonna want, if you're gonna support decarbonisation, you need to help the industries that are going to be able to allow businesses to decarbonise, um, so they can often use our scheme almost as a as a dis, as a, to offer a discount to, to businesses um, and that's a, a way in which we work with, with them um schemes around I mean, yeah. sorry no i was just okay. going to say i mean hopefully there's a lot of um small to medium-sized businesses on here that want uh, yeah. want some money to help them save some money so that's absolutely fantastic we'll, yeah. we'll come back into a bit more detail about that in just a second i'll just move on to introducing Sarah. Sarah is Development and Technical Director at Inesco. Now, again, Sarah is hugely qualified to talk to us tonight because since joining Inesco, Sarah has seen has been a part of development 
of over 105 solar farms and 150 megawatts of battery storage. Sarah, what are your team doing to help people in Wokiem drive innovation and, you know, and capitalise on renewable energy? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been uh, I've been with Enesco actually for eight and a half years now. Um, and before that, I was a, a project manager for rooftop solar installations. So to see the the huge amount of, of change and evolution over time um, and also to see uh, more and more solar going on onto rooftops has been very, very interesting. But um, so Enesco, are, they're a tanky service provider. So we do everything from the kind of development, engineering and design, construction, the long-term operations and maintenance, but also the optimization of um, solar and battery storage assets. So we primarily specialize in solar and battery storage. Um, we also look at the occasional uh, other technologies such as heating technologies, but they are not our, our core specialisms. Um, but also in respect to solar and battery storage, we do everything from the kind of smaller, smaller scale of small businesses all the way up to, as you say, the, the much larger solar and, and battery storage installations. So it's quite interesting to see the kind of um, electricity network from that micro perspective, but also, you know, we're, we're dealing with national grid on a, a much larger scale as well. So we get that length and breadth of knowledge of the electricity system um, so how how we can help local businesses in the in the area well um, we offer like I say the, these turnkey service provisions um, part of that we can offer consultancy services as well so we can look at your your businesses and say you know, what is your current energy usage what could we do in terms of solar and or battery storage what does that mean in terms of, of returns on investment for you um, and how is that going to look over time in, in terms of policies and other regulations that might be coming into effect? So we can do all of that as part of cons uh, consultancy work, but we can also do it as part of a wider piece on, on the actual development, engineering and construction as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. That's, uh, that's excellent. Now, I'll just move on to Amira. Now, Amira has a Master's in Sustainability from the University of Sydney and is currently undertaking the leadership programme of the UK Green Building Council. But more interestingly for me and the people here in Wokingham, she's also the person that's leading the sustainability strategy for the Winners Triangle Business Park. Now, Amira, how is that going and uh, how have you found that process so far? Thanks, Gregor. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on this forum as well. Um, so, like you said, I'm the sustainability manager for uh, Fraser's Property UK. Uh, we're the owner sort of, and manager of Fraser's Triangle Business Park. Many of you might have uh, driven past it or even been into it. Uh, we're opposite Winners Triangle Station. Um, Fraser's Property is a company. Uh, we're a global asset owner, manager and developer. Um, we have operations uh, in the UK, Australia, Asia and Europe. Um, here in the UK, we do manage and own a number of business parks. So in Wokingham, it's our Winners Triangle, uh, but we have also own business parks in uh, Farnborough, Bracknell, Basingstoke and Camberley. Um, Winners Triangle is really a key business park in our portfolio. Uh, it's mixed use. There's 55 buildings. We have 64 companies uh, that call Winners Triangle home. Um, and there's about 5,500 people that enjoy the park amenities as well. Um, we as a company and Winners Triangle have committed to achieving net zero carbon by 2050. And that's across our entire portfolio. And we've also set an interim target to be net zero carbon by 2030 in the areas that we control. Um, so our direct control is to, to be zero carbon by 2030. Um, and in terms of the process, how we found it, we kicked off our sustainability strategy about 18 months ago now. Um, and we've set a number of ambitious targets to really bring the portfolio forward uh, to future-proof our assets um, and to really engage and align with our tenants and occupiers um, because we can see that they're also taking sustainability and reducing their emissions very seriously. So we're aligning with them on that. 
Great, thank you all. Um, it's really interesting to hear what, uh, what all of you are working on. Now, to the to the main crux of, of the evening. So I've got some, some questions for you. Um, some of them have come in from our audience. Some of them have come from myself and from the officers of WBC. So Sarah, I'll start with you on this one, if that's okay. So um, what do you think for you and for your organisation, the benefits of decarbonisation are and have been? Yeah, absolutely. So I think decarbonisation is obviously a very important topic over the past few years and certainly into the into the future. Um, so the UK have set their, their net zero carbon targets and, and our mission statement has been very much around the, the government agenda, which is to accelerate the transition to, to net zero. Um, and we do that by both working with businesses, but also um, with funders and investors in the market as well. Um, so for us, I mean, our, our entire company is shaped around decarbonisation and, and helping to accelerate these businesses and, and achieving their net zero carbon targets. Um, and I think, you know, interestingly for us as a company individually, we've um, only fairly recently set ourselves our, our own targets on um, reaching net zero as well, um, which is quite ironic in light of the fact of the services that we provide. Um, but we're doing things like installing you know, EV charge points, solar on our rooftop. Uh, we've got a ground source heat pump actually next to our, our offices. Um, and it's just incredibly interesting to, to be part of the actual decarbonisation agenda directly, but then also facilitate businesses, companies, funders and investors in, in being able to achieve their net zero carbon targets as well. Um, I think what's really interesting is in the future, um, we're not only dealing with a very intricate and intermittent network where we're going to have a lot more renewable energy on that network, um, but we're also going to need a high level of flexibility as well. Um, and that's why really the solar and battery storage goes hand in hand, obviously wind as well. Um, but we need that flexibility on the network in order to, to manage that intermittency. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens over time, but but decarbonisation is very much at our, our core. So, Tom, you know, your, yours is a business that is very heavily into facilitating other people on their decarbonisation journey. So, you know, for you, what, what are the benefits of decarbonisation and how are you finding the customer base in their, their decarbonisation journey? Yeah, so um, I think the, the main business, the main benefit for businesses um, that might be an initial thing from a business point of view is definitely the the saving on energy bills. So obviously there is a carbon emission yeah. saving associated with with all the projects that we do, but they also have large savings on their annual energy bills or if it's waste disposal on waste disposal costs. Um, so over the course of the whole project, which has been going since 2017, um, we've actually seen... Uh, Eight hundred and seventy-one thousand pounds of uh, per year saved to businesses through the energy usage, and that's uh, equivalent also of just under two and a half thousand tons of CO2 emissions. So I think that's that's something that, even though, it, when you think when you think about it, it's it's pretty, it's, it's logical that if you if you save the amount of energy you're using, you're going to save your energy bills. But just how much you might be able to save just by something like LED lighting or solar panels, is is not something that people might know about. So. In Berkshire, in in the Berkshire projects that we've put forward, which has been going since 2020, on average, um, the uh, an applicant is saving uh, £1,425 a year on on their energy or waste disposal bills from projects that we've put, put through. Um, as well as this, the technologies that we are able to fund, things like heating, draft proofing, they can also provide improvements to the workplace so there's a lot of secondary benefits to to decarbonization on top of of on top of reducing your carbon footprint so i think this is that's definitely something that we get a feedback from customers things like energy lighting as well the light's nicer it doesn't need replacing as much because it's not as energy intensive it's not as susceptible to damage over time because not as much energy is going through the unit um, and so there's, there's a lot of secondary benefits to, to decarbonization um, also obviously as um, green issues have become more prevalent in the spotlight um, green credentials is definitely something that businesses need to have now it's something that um, all consumers are, are wanting and I think there's a survey in uh, 2019 a Nielsen survey that showed that 73 percent of consumers would favor a more environmentally friendly product um, and that can only have, have gone up in the in since then so I, mean, I think it's really important that the businesses have this have this so they can display that they're doing something about it 
Um, just... so, so that's a really interesting point that you raise, and I'll, I'll put this question to Amira. You know, your, your business is effectively facilitating carbon reduction for other companies, you know, the, the people who occupy your, your business park. So, yeah, are your customers pulling you towards decarbonisation? Are you pushing them towards decarbonisation or is it really a sort of mutual benefit, mutual programme? Thanks, Gregor. So, um I think there's a it's a little bit of both actually. Um, we have some um, quite large occupiers now in Winners Triangle who are part of global companies, so they already have their own decarbonisation agenda and have already committed to net zero carbon. Um, and we're looking to work with these companies because we're effectively we're trying to both reduce carbon in the assets that we own and that they're occupying. Um, so we have sort of mutual interest there. For many of our other occupiers, we're certainly doing a, a lot of work, especially in the buildings that uh, we have the control over in our um, sort of multi-tenanted buildings, similar to what Tom described that they're doing, uh, particularly for businesses, we're doing for buildings. So focusing really on those cost-saving me measures such as uh, LED lighting, uh, replacing boilers, like electrification of our buildings. Uh, we are already procuring 100% renewable electricity across all of the um, areas and finished triangle that we have control over, um, as well as empowering more of our uh, tenants uh, to be responsible for the emissions and the consumption that they have. So, for example, uh, we've got a smart metering um, installation program that's ongoing. So, where we can, we're making sure that each tenancy has a sort of an um, can automatically see how much water, how much gas, electricity that they've used in a month, in a quarter, in a day, um, and they're able to track that um, because once you have that information, um, you know employees are, are more likely to make change themselves as well. Um, so yeah, in answer to your question, is it's a little bit of both. <laughs> Okay, so I'll, I'll stay with you just for a second, Amira, because there's something I'm, I'm really interested in, which is it's a year today since we went into lockdown. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been a challenging year, and I'm sure for for you and your business, there's you've seen a massive change in the way that people are using your sites, using your facilities, the volume of people that are in there every single day. What sort of impact has has COVID had on? your business, but particularly on your decarbonisation agenda? And have you seen any sort of, I guess, potential unwitting upsides from, from COVID as a result? Yeah, so we've seen, um, I mean, as with many businesses, um, everyone, almost everyone's been working from home. So there certainly hasn't been the activity uh, in 2020 that we normally see on our business parks and at Winish. Um, however, we are ramping up sort of efforts now that restrictions are ending. Um, we've got sort of more events coming on and um, all of our offices are COVID secure and sort of ready to return to work. Um, in terms of 2020, we did see quite large um, emission reductions or sort of energy reduction um, around varying between sort of 20 to 30 percent um, energy reductions across the, the areas that we manage um, compared to a, a 2019 year. Um, what we're seeing now is that Occupiers are focusing more on the quality of space. Um, obviously, air quality is a, a quite a big issue at the moment. Um, and occupiers and their employees are looking to um, work in buildings now that are better than their home, where they have access to uh, better amenities, um, access to nature. We've got like the Winnish Meadows behind our business park, and there's a much greater focus on, on health. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, uh, and of course, is the increase in active travel. So last year, 1.3 million British citizens bought a bike, and I was one of them. And I love riding my bike, um, and I'd like to ride it to work as well. So um, I'm not the only one. So making sure that our business park is completely um, sort of cycle um, making sure it's um, available for cyclers, walkers, uh, even runners as well, and making sure we have that amenity in place. 
Uh, for example, we're, we've got lockers, showers. Uh, we're going to install a bike hub um, in the centre of Winnish Triangle because we know that people are focused more on that active travel and don't want to be um, sort of uh, crammed anymore in public transport. Um, that being said, we do have, you know, we've got the, the station and buses that run through the, the park. Um, so I think those are probably the, the two main things. And and actually the potentially increased space requirements as well. We are so used to now working from home that when we go back into the office, we don't want to be sort of sitting in a pen shoulder to shoulder with our colleagues. We want a bit more space. We want space for collaboration, to socialise. Um, and we expect perhaps that might um, increase as well. Okay, so thank you for that. Now I'll move on to, to Sarah and the impact that COVID has had on, on your business as well, particularly looking at solar installations on, on buildings, on rooftops. What impact are you seeing? Because, you know, in some ways, COVID has been the ideal opportunity to, to do the installations. Um, and in other ways, it's it's not because people aren't there to use the energy in the first place. So what what sort of impact have you seen from from COVID and, and the impact on its de your decarbonisation agenda? Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. So we have been having multiple conversations with businesses about um, their decarbonisation strategies, particularly looking at installing renewable technologies. Um, and I think what's been interesting is if we, we've actually got some existing key clients of ours that we've installed installations for already and they've got a suite of, of different um, portfolios of properties um, and a lot of them particularly hospitality sector have um, unfortunately put it on hold and sort of said you know they have a very clear agenda that they still want to do it at some point in the future hopefully not too distant future um, but it's certainly been put on hold for, for many businesses at the moment. Um, I think what is going to be interesting is some of the analysis that we have done previously, um, which is based on historical usage data um, going forward, is that still going to be accurate? Um, because ideally you would need you know, a year's worth of, of usage data to be able to accurately um, model, particularly battery storage, which is often uh, missold to a lot of customers. It's very, very kind of site specific technology. So when you when you start to look at the analysis for both solar and battery storage, and you're starting to look at historical data, but then how that's likely to to change going forward, that leads to quite a few challenges for us. Um, and it it's a case of several businesses having to rethink: you know, are they likely to go back to to the ways of working that they were? At previously or are things likely to change and, and how are things likely to change um, so we're starting to see that increasingly more often um, over the past few months um, again I think there's, there's still very much um, an agenda for many businesses to decarbonize so we are getting approached by multiple different companies um, and yeah I guess it would just be interesting to see what happens going forward and, and what about you, Tom? What's what's been the the short term impact of COVID on on you and the the low carbon workspace grants? Have you seen an uptake in businesses wanting to decarbonise while their staff are working from home? Have you seen a change in the patterns of businesses coming forward? Yeah, is it a different type of business that's coming forward um, to you at the moment? So during the first lockdown, we saw a, a massive drop in applications as as the, the grant scheme is match funded. Businesses were understandably not wanting to in, invest at that time. Um, as we've now come at, at, since coming into the new year, um, I think with the announcements of how things are going to go forward, businesses are a bit, a bit more confident now. Um, and we have seen an upturn in, um, in applications uh, since, since that point. Um, we have also been definitely been getting a lot more inquiries about installations for people working from home, which is understandable as people are now thinking about it in their home as well as in their business or business premises. That's not something, unfortunately, that we can uh, provide funding for. It has to be on a, on a commercial premises. Um, but we've um, we've also seen actually we've um, an, an increase in in solar. Um, there has been an uptake of solar. It used to be 0.6 percent of applications. Um, uh, 
in what we call phase one of this program, which was 2017 to uh, 2020. And now during phase two, um, it's actually 10% of applications and, and the, the second most popular um, installation to get done is solar. We we need to have to do some more analysis as to why this is. Um, but there is thinking that potentially if businesses have got, if they if they are going to be thinking about, oh, people aren't going to be in the office all the time, people are going to be only in works a few times a week. Well, instead of treating this premises as just a dead space that won't be occupied, then this could actually be an asset. And if we if if there's going to be generating electricity that we can then feed back into into the grid, then that could be um, a way to to solve that problem at least in part for for them. No, uh, that that's really interesting, Tom. Thank you for that. I mean, I think. Um, certainly, we as a council have seen a massive shift in the way that we use our buildings and the way that we think about our buildings. Um, and certainly, you know, the the poll that we we did right at the very start, it, we asked everybody how important should decarbonisation be for local business, and 94% of our respondents have said it's very important. So, rather than looking at the past, Tom, I'll, I'll stay with you. What do you think the priorities of the decarbonisation agenda is going to be? over the next year to 18 months as we come out of lockdown and come out of COVID? So I think the priorities for decarbonisation going going forward are, are going to be helping with, as much as is going to be possible, it's going to be helping with um, the, the financial part of it because even though the economy will be hopefully picking, well, is, plan, is projected to be picking back up coming out of, uh, coming out of lockdowns, coming out of, of the pandemic, there won't necessarily be the in investment for for every business to make these make these changes. And when you're upgrading equipment, when you're um, changing your supply chains, things like that, things like that, to try and reduce your, your um, carbon footprint, it's it's not something that can can always be done uh, for free, um, or that doesn't have a cost associated with it. Also, there's going to, I think going to need to be going to need to be a lot more advice for businesses because uh, that's something that we often see as people come to us just saying we want to do something but we we don't know we don't know what it is we can do um, and often it's something simple and it's just that people don't have that that knowledge base and that knowledge base isn't as out there for people as it, as it could be so i think definitely advice and funding are going to be things that are going to be key to, to help businesses decarbonize going forward Thank you for that, Tom. I mean, I certainly, in my in my role at the council, the most common question that I get asked is, "Where do I start?" What do, yeah, if I if I can only do one thing, what do I do first? So, no pressure, Sarah. Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Um, Sarah, if I can only do one thing, what do I do first? Um, I think. I mean, we often see a lot, I've already mentioned it once, but there is a lot of mis-selling. I think it's really, really important that businesses are doing the right thing for them. Um, and it can be very, very site-specific. So not every business is going to benefit from a battery unit or from a certain size solar PV array or from a heat pump. You know, it, it can be very, very site-specific. I think you can start by doing um, you know, potentially more simple measures like LED lighting, which is pretty straightforward, not too capital intensive, um, and you'll see immediate savings from doing it. Um, when you start to look at technologies such as renewable um, renewable energy, so solar in particular is our, our specialty, so I'll touch on that initially, but um, really important that you, you size it correctly. Um, so I'd say... You know, reach out to companies that are not just going to um, come along and, and throw some solar on the roof and just maximise the roof space and then walk away again. You want a company who can analyse your, your usage data properly, look at your bill data, look at how it might change over time um, and then compare that with different size um, solar arrays. You know, what happens if we add a battery? You know, what savings would you be looking at with a heat pump? Um, and you weigh everything up and then you can look at you know, in terms of the actual capital outlay, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what's the ultimately the best return on investment that you would be able to, to afford at that stage. Um, and I think multiple companies that we speak to, um, we actually come along in the process 
potentially later on so after they've actually had solar installed or after they've had a battery installed um and it's it's crazy how many of them are just completely kind of incorrect for that business um and we're having to then go back and retrospectively add some more solar or, or do something slightly different for them so that they can get a better return on investment so yeah it's, it's just making sure that it's analysed correctly as early as possible rather than jumping into a decision just because it looks good. Um, it's definitely not the right thing to do. Thank you. So, Amira, interesting that you're, you're one of the businesses that has had to start at the where do I begin phase. Um, and you've also represent a whole load of other companies who are right at the beginning of that where do I begin phase, what do I do first. So, yeah, where did you start on your journey and where do you go to when your when your customers, your clients, the people that, that rent your buildings come to you and say, right, we're starting on this journey? What advice do you give them? Yeah, so um, if you don't mind, I actually might address one of the questions that came through and I'll come back to your question. So the question was around um, what are the, the phrases, goals um, towards each building on Winnish um, and what are we doing to be sort of self-sufficient? So, I mean, first of all, uh, we're looking at the the building. So the best practice is we're looking at uh, building fabric. Um, so ensuring someone else mentioned in the comments, um, are we looking at sort of passive house, which is how can we minimise the heating and cooling required for a building, that it's maintaining a constant temperature inside. So that's number one. The second one is, um, like Tom and Sarah have said, is the, the energy efficiency, so maxing out um, where we can, the energy efficiency of lights, the plant equipment, optimising the building um, for the equipment that it has. Um, thirdly, and Sarah can speak a lot to this, probably more than I can, but is the renewable energy piece. So bringing down the emissions um, through renewable energy. We've just installed uh, some solar power. We're just shy of about 400 kilowatts of short solar uh, rooftop power at um, Winnish Triangle um, and we're looking to roll that out um, more that was sort of like a pilot for us and we're going to do that a lot more across Winnish um, and then lastly would be sort of offsetting and so um, we want to reduce that as much as possible um, so we are getting the energy efficiency and um, uh, the renewables first. Um, back to your question about sort of where do we start I mean, my where we started was what's happening in the market. Um, you can look to the the UK government has set a target to be net zero carbon by 2050. So we should like all businesses should expect to see legislation and policies coming through from the government um, that will assist with decarbonisation. Um, and so looking to see. Also, what are your relevant industry associations uh, committing to? So for us as landlords, many of our peers have uh, similar commitments to us. And this is, you know, in the last sort of couple of years, everyone is talking about net zero carbon and the urgency to reduce emissions to zero so we can align and sort of meet the agreements of the, the Paris Agreement um, to, to limit global warming. So um, for us, it was, yeah, doing a sort of a market analysis and seeing that really committing to net zero carbon by 2050 is in line with many of our, um, what the market is doing. It's in line with our occupiers as well. So we are on similar journeys. Um, and then getting the buy-in and support, many of our employees in the company were already saying like, yes, we, we need to do this. We want to do this. Um, so I'd say uh, for people on the call, you know, if you've got sustainability champions in your business or, you know, it's already on your agenda, um, you know, host a workshop. What can we do? What are the types of targets we should be setting? What are our peers and competitors setting as well? Um, and what are our supply chain? What do they expect from us? If we're in the supply chain or um, we're suppliers, um, what are they what types of targets are they setting and then once you've sort of done that work and engaged your staff uh, which is what we did we're able to sort of present uh, a bit of like a comprehensive strategy not just focused on energy but our sustainability strategy covers um, water waste 
biodiversity, health and well-being, uh, risk like climate change, like physical climate change risk. Um, so it is we sort of took a comprehensive point of view. Um, and so, yeah, but our sort of net zero carbon target is is such a driver for many of those other points of sustainability as well. Thank you for that, Amira. And I, I want to use this carbon conversation as an opportunity to help inspire other people that might be you know, watching this as well um, with some ideas of different things that they can do. Now, we've heard the views of our panel in terms of some of the things that businesses could do, but we're now going to hold another one of our polls. So the second poll, has your business made any changes to reduce its carbon footprint? Um, and your options are we've made lots of changes, we've made some changes, or we haven't made any changes. If you have made changes, what I'd ask is once you've completed the poll, can you please go into the chat and just add in some of the things that you have done um, and just share with the other people that are on here um, the different ideas, the different things that your business, your organization have done in order to help cut their carbon footprint so that we can share that with everybody. And so also later on, we might be able to discuss some of the ideas with the panel, um, get their thoughts and, and talk about how we can bring them to, to life. Now, Tom, I'll come back to you for the next question while while everybody is is completing this poll. So, what do you think the main challenges that small to medium sized organisations, the the people that you deal with on a regular basis, have when it comes to cutting their carbon footprint? So, I think the the main thing that we get from that we can see from people, obviously applying to us for grants, is 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 uh, the financial. Uh, the financial barrier. Um, I think there are things that are, are cheap, you know, a small boiler replacement, some LED lighting replacements, they can be quite quick, cheap things to do, but um, installing uh, so solar voltaics, um, installing big boilers or big machinery replacement, that is something that can be um, can be a big barrier. Um, if you've got a, bi a big office block that's covered in windows and you want to, and they're not double glazed and you need to change those, that's a big, big investment to make. Um, so I think that's that's definitely probably the biggest the biggest challenge um the, is the upfront cost to, to those changes obviously you, through, over time those will pay back because you'll be making savings through um, energy saving or through waste saving or anything like that but initially you need that help to really get you over the line and, and be able to to get that project going um also not knowing where your carbon footprint is coming from is is another another issue that i think people people face people when we talk about waste, for example, when we talk about the scheme, people often just think we're going to be helping to replace boilers or um, helping to reduce electricity consumption on site. But that waste, there's a big carbon footprint associated with that waste and just not knowing that that, that is the case and that, that uh, sending waste to landfill has such a big uh, carbon carbon footprint is, is definitely a, a barrier. And again, it's also all about spreading the knowledge about how businesses can can make those um, make those changes. Thank you for that, Tom. Sarah, what what are your thoughts on that? What do you what do you think are the the main challenges that that small to medium sized businesses that you deal with are facing in decarbonising? Yeah, so I uh, I totally agree with with what Tom said, and that there's definitely financial barriers and and knowledge barriers, um, and that's where so certainly on the knowledge barriers, that's where we can come in and and help. Um, in just making sure that the analysis is is done correctly, um, and I know that we've got more of a focus on on solar and battery storage, uh, but we we've got plenty of partners who who work in different areas as well. Um, so if a business were to come to us and and seeking that help, then you know, we would we would be able to help them with that. Um, I'd add a, a third barrier. I think the the forecasting what your energy usage is is likely to be in future. Um, is a is a very challenging task, um, and I think and certainly when we look at you know, EVs, there's multiple businesses out there who are now thinking about adding charge points, um, and what does that mean in terms of a likely increase in your electricity usage going forward? Um, so I think we're seeing certainly many companies coming to us and saying, hey, "What do you think in terms of?" likely increases to our electricity bills over x amount of years and how can we mitigate against that today in what we're doing so i think the added complications on 
yeah, let's get the analysis right today and then let's try and apply that to a, a prediction yeah. over X amount of years and then enforce it on that basis. And um, that's that's certainly what we're seeing a lot of today. Thank you, Sarah. And and what about you, Amira? What what do you think in terms of the, the feedback that you're getting from your customer base? What are the biggest struggles that they're facing, biggest challenges they've got when they're starting the, their decarbonisation journey? Sure. So, um, I mean, like Tom and Sarah said, it's um, number one is sort of financial, um, the upfront cost. But as we know, a lot of these energy efficiency measures, the payback can be sort of one to two years going up to maybe more seven, eight years for, for larger replacements, as Tom was describing. Um, thankfully, you know, there are grants and, and tax breaks uh, available. Um, I guess one of the other ones is, yeah, like where do I start? There are so many aspects of how I could decarbonise, um, you know, your own offices. What I would say um, is ask your landlord. So we engage quite often with our occupiers. Uh, the site team will happily sort of, if they're invited, go into a sort of a building, might just do a walk around assessment. Um, but I'd say to you know the people on the call, ask your landlord what they're doing and see, okay, well, where could we work together um, to reduce carbon? Maybe they've already got plans to do upgrades to the sort of core equipment of the building. Um, can you also potentially partner on um, sort of local upgrades to the building or um, so I'd say like yeah that collaboration piece is really important and like there are grants as, as Tom's business is um, sort of advertising is that there are grants available as well. Now ROI has been mentioned a couple of times um, and Tom, there is a specific question for you that has come up in the chat, which I'll put to you, um, but then I'll open it up to Sarah and Amira because they, they've probably got thoughts on this as well. But um, it says, please could Tom advise on the average SME cost per head for reduced energy usage and also the payback period or ROI for the SME's investment? Yes, I did see that question from from Tony come in, and I, I don't have those specific figures for for us to hand, but I'd be I'm happy to get back to Tony on that to get some specific figures. That's definitely something that I could get together. So um, I'd have to come back for those specific figures um, on the grant scheme, but happy to get those. Sure, but in in terms of mm -hmm. ROI on the types of investments yeah. that that people are making, you know, what what do you think? In terms of yeah, you know, in terms of that RMI, what do you think the things that people could do? Which ones are going to give them likely give them the best ROI up front, and which ones are likely to give them the best carbon saving up front as well? So the best carbon savings up front are probably going to be things like solar, where you're just totally removing any um, any grid grid electricity. Potentially, if you're getting not solar voltaics but solar panels, you'd be reducing your gas use of use of gas as well. Um, in terms of carbon, things like that. Um, Waste as well is, is is definitely in terms of carbon. Waste is definitely the, the biggest the, the biggest projects we've put through on the scheme have always been been waste projects. So the initial return investment for carbon is waste. In terms of return on investment for um, from money, LED lighting is immediate because the, as soon as they're installed, you're immediately saving. You know, generally it's at least 50%. It can be up to 90% of electricity light of the lighting load demand can go down. And that's just an immediate saving. As soon as that's installed, that's that's going through. It's not something like a boiler. If you get that installed in the summer, um, obviously hot water will start being saved, but you're not really going to see those those effects until the winter time. So any, any equipment that's used immediately, um, you'll definitely see a saving on compressor systems is another one. Um, they're used all the time. If you replace those, that makes an immediate um, an immediate saving because they're being used continually by by businesses, especially heavy manufacturing businesses. Now I'll open it up to to Sarah and to Amira. Do either of you have anything you want to to say to add in terms of ROI and the immediate impact? Sarah, you've unmuted, so uh, <laughs> I'll bring you in first. <laughs> yeah, sure. I can uh, I can do a, a deeper dive into solar and, and battery storage. Um, so. Solar has had, well, in fact, battery storage as well, has had a, an interesting journey <clears throat> over the past 10 years. So there were subsidies available for solar. Um, and about 10 years ago, it, they say, those subsidies sorry, were very lucrative. Um, and we saw a huge boom in the market for solar PV on rooftops as a result. 
Um, I think the government decided to cut the subsidies that were available to solar quite quite drastically, and it did have quite quite a significant impact on the uptake of solar in the market. Um, interestingly, what we're seeing today, and it's probably happened since about 12 months ago, um, solar can absolutely stand on its own two feet now. It does not need subsidies to be able to make the investment attractive. So with the subsidies 10 years ago, we were looking at, you know, on average, around a seven-year uh, seven year payback. And today, you will see on average around a seven-year payback. Um, and that's without subsidies at all. So there's, there's a huge amount of evolution that's happened over time. Um, and it's mainly because the technology itself has improved in efficiency so much. So you know, the same panel that was producing 185 watts 10 years ago is now producing over 500 watts. I mean, a significant increase in, in capacity. Um, and that combined with significant reduction in costs means that, you know, is it, again, a, a mini boom that we're seeing in the market not just from a, a smaller scale, but also large scale as well. Battery storage has had uh, an interesting story as well. I think battery storage emerged into the market at a later date. Um, it's seen as a, a flexible technology. Um, the main barriers to entry for battery storage was cost. So very, very high cost to begin with. Um, fortunately, some interesting markets started to open up for battery storage. Um, I would say revenues available for batteries is very, very different to solar um, in terms of what you could do with a battery. Generally speaking, for, for SMEs, your, your benefit is taking generation off site, storing it in the battery and using it at other times during the day um, that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get um, directly from your solar. Um, so it's basically peak shifting. Your solar is going to be generating you know, significantly in the middle of the day and dropping off morning and, and evening. So you're trying to just lop off that that peak and disperse it to either the morning or the evening and spread out your, your load. And the reason why I say battery storage is often missold is because people often think that you need a much larger battery to, to store as much energy as possible from the solar, whereas in fact, quite a small battery that you would need to, to make the return on investment as effective as possible. Um, so solar is, is the most attractive of the two technologies in terms of return on investment. And um, battery is a, a complementary technology and is, is very site specific. So it would only really stack up in, in certain cases. Um, but I agree with Tom as well, just on, on LED lighting, that's, that's almost a, a no-brainer. I'd say the return on investment you would get for that is, is very short. So, Amira, you're doing this for a lot of your sites around the world. So what are you seeing in terms of offering the best ROI for you and for your customers? Yeah, I mean, similar responses. So um, to, to Tom and Sarah, in Australia, for example, um, sunny for 300 days of the year, uh, solar panels are seeing sort of paybacks of three to four years. Um, so it's, I think, one in three, the stat is one in three households in Australia have uh, solar panels um, and that the commercial offices is not too far behind. So um, it is very, like, that potentially is the trajectory uh, for the UK as well as it becomes more cost um, cost efficient. Um, and Sarah sort of hit the nail on the head. We're seeing an exact sort of seven-year return um, on our solar panels that we've just installed at Winners Triangle uh, on some of our commercial offices. And so uh, for us as a long-term investor, our tenants will be benefiting from a, a reduction in electricity costs and um, it's a it's a viable option for us to decrease our emissions. So we'll, we'll continue with that. Um, we're also looking for that electrification of our buildings. So over time, um, we'll be looking to replace boilers, for example, um, and sort of any gas uh, equipment that will, the payback is a lot longer on those ones um, and it's a much larger capital expenditure um, but I mean it's not too much more to add from Tom and Sarah that yeah LED lights these sort of quick wins are the, the, the easiest and I'd probably say smart metering as well so you can actually measure that um, reduction. 
Now, you, you make a really interesting point there about Australia and one in three houses having solar panels. Um, I, I'm particularly fascinated by that because in the UK, it seems that every year we just require more and more energy. And we're building solar farms and we're building offshore wind farms, but we still need more and more energy every year. And on top of that, we're seeing electric vehicles becoming more and more popular and they are clearly going to require more and more electricity. So, Amira, starting with you, how do you or how do we support the rollout of EV uh, EV vehicles, EV charging going forward to make sure that, you know, firstly, we have enough energy to meet the demand, but secondly, we've got EV where people actually genuinely want to charge? Yeah, so we've got a um, currently across all of our portfolio in the UK, we've got about 78 EV charging points. Um, in Winnish Triangle, uh, I think it's got about 10 of those. Um, and we're looking to increase that uh, with our new sort of EV charging strategy um, that we're developing at the moment because we see that um, numerous cars, uh, car manufacturing companies have committed to only producing electric vehicles. Ford and Volvo have made that commitment to start from 2030. So really in the next nine years, any new after nine years, any new cars potentially will only be electric. So for us, that's really important um, in supporting our occupiers and their and their um, employees. And it comes back to almost like a chicken and the egg. Or do you put in the infrastructure or do you survey your um, occupiers or their employees to say, or oh, would you buy an electric vehicle? But really the research shows us if you put in the infrastructure, uh, people will follow. And so we think if putting in um, all of our refurbishments and new buildings will be EV uh, EV charging sort of ready um, and we'll have the, the charging points there accessible for, for all the occupiers um, on the park um, and some of them are also public for the public to come into the park as well um, and so yeah that is a really important part of our, of our strategy uh, to ensure the resilience of our park. So, Tom, what about for you? So, do, do low-carbon workspaces support EV and EV rollout? Uh, if so, how? Um, and if not, how can you support reducing people's energy usage so that they can support EV going forward? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, the scheme, uh, due to the funding agreement we have in place, we don't support EVs as a measure that we're able to, to um, supply grant funding for. Um, we do get interest in EVs, though, and in things like EV uh, charge points. So we will direct people to the, the government schemes that can pay for um, commercial charging points on, on business premises. Um, but I think, yeah, definitely, if we're going to be shifting from petrol being petrol diesel being the energy source that powers our cars to electricity from, from the grid, we definitely need to be focusing on cleaning up the grid, um, making sure that while we're also cleaning up the grid, what's drawing from the grid is reducing in what it's drawing. So if you have you know, any any energy efficiencies that you can you can make to reduce how much energy you're taking from the grid to free that energy up to be able to be used to charge people's cars is, is definitely important. So I think although we can't directly support electric vehicles, if we're helping people reduce the energy they use through um, more efficient machinery, LED lighting, uh, more efficient electrical heating, then that will help with the demand that's going to come as more people are buying uh, electric vehicles. Thanks, Tom. Um, Sarah, how, how practical is it for businesses to install EV charging on their sites using solar that they've generated themselves? Uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty easy, actually. EV charge points are they're actually not too capital intensive to install. Um, they, we, again, we're seeing many organisations who are now looking to, to implement EV charge points. Um, depending on your location and your circumstances, you can, well, there are opportunities for actually leasing car parking spaces. Um, and what I mean by that is there are companies out there who will be willing to put in the EV charge points for free, um, but they will reap the rewards from people who are then charging and paying for the electricity. So there are different ways of, of doing it. 
Um, typically, those companies that are interested in, in leasing those car parking spaces are companies where um, you, you would need to be in a, a fairly strategic location for them so that they feel they are going to get their return on investment from usage of their EVs. But um, yeah, I think EVs are significant for our future. Um, and I think it's the one thing that National Grid, from a macro perspective, are actually very concerned about. Um, and how are we going to manage our electricity system with more and more EV charging coming online? Um, there's going to be a, a huge increase in, in demand for electricity to be able to charge our vehicles. Um, and we at UNESCO have been thinking long and hard about you know, what are people likely to do? And I think we, we've come to the conclusion that priority number one is probably going to be charging at home. Um, it's the, generally going to be the cheapest way of charging because you can do trickle charging, um, which is over a long period of time and wouldn't cost very much. Um, and that we can go into things like vehicle to, to grid as well and go into detail as to how actually you're storing electricity in your car and could that power parts of your home. Um, but uh, the second priority would be charging at destination in RV. So that is when people are getting to the office and getting to work, they are potentially going to need to have EV charge points available there to be able to charge their vehicle to be able to then return home. Um, the third the kind of last priority is uh, charging on route, so on your way to a destination. Um, interestingly, there are companies out there at the moment who feel that, that it, that's a, a sure thing. People are going to want to stop off like they do at the moment at petrol stations and charge their vehicles. I think we are a little bit more sceptical about it. I think people are really going to want to kind of stop halfway through a journey and wait I think shortest amount of time, 10, 15 minutes for their for their car to charge. Um, and it's going to be incredibly expensive. Or are you going to try and charge at home or destination? Probably more likely. So I think it's it's definitely going to be a key priority seeing more EV charge points at home and more EV charge points at SMEs and, and businesses across the UK. Yeah, so it's really interesting. The um, the guy who leads our um, our industry advisory board at Working Borough Council. He's the decarbonisation lead for the national grid. And to the point that you just made there, Sarah, you know, he said to us a couple of weeks ago, you know, the average journey for per people in the UK is 37 miles. Mm -hmm. So that charging en route, if you if you do it properly, you can charge up at home. Your journey every day is an average of 37 miles. You never really need to charge up other places but people still do commute long distances to get to their work, to get to their offices. And so you know, your point about charging at destination is absolutely right. The one thing that I, I keep coming back to, though, is well, what about all of the delivery vans that are on the road? What about all of those supply chain vehicles that are out there? You know, it's, it's not just me commuting or me going to see my, my family or me, you know, going into town to do my shopping. There's all of these fleet of vehicles out there that actually within 10 years they can't be petrol or diesel they're going to be transitioning over to electric as well so we've got to start thinking about actually how we're going to maintain our supply chains going forward but anyway i i digress i should move back to the questions for you rather than <laughs> rather than just talking but it, it leads me on to the next question which um i'll, I'll start with you sarah on this one is what do you think will be the biggest driver for decarbonisation over the next 10 years? Um, definitely going to be a push from, from above, from the government. Um, so changing policies, changing legislation, we're already seeing it today, um, you know, enforcing um, the electric vehicles by 2030, for instance. I mean, that's going to be a significant change. Um, I think the government are really in the driving seat in you know, how we're going to achieve the targets and support they need to give to certain aspects of, of the industry and, and how are they going to achieve their targets. So definitely a significant driver from a, a policy perspective. Um, and then the other significant driver, I would say, is is, is cost. So um, you know, 
energy bills are only expected to increase over time. So if you have the ability to be more self-sufficient, generate your own electricity or just simply reduce your energy usage, um, that's going to be a significant driver. To be honest, I think it already is a significant driver for for many businesses across the UK. Um, And then I guess the third one I I would add is, uh, again, just touching on electric vehicles. Fundamentally, we're going to have to change our ways in terms of, of transport. Um, so I think in order to do that, we're, we're going to have to think about how we can manage our electricity system. And that will be both from a, a micro business level, but also from a, a much higher macro level as well. And it's certainly a key challenge that we're seeing today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll come to you, Amira, next with, with the same question. What, what do you think is going to be the biggest driver for decarbonisation over the next 10 years? agree that it will be uh, legislation um, and movements from government. Um, I also think it will be the the need to future-proof uh, your own business uh, and your operations. So if you treat climate change as any other risk, um, if we think back to a sort of a basic risk register, um, you know, you've identified the risks. What can you do to now reduce the risk to your business? Um, and as we've discussed, the, the energy efficiency savings um, are really there. And unlike COVID, climate change is something that we can prepare for um, and that we can plan to, to decarbonise um, our operations. And one of the other drivers may be uh, linking back to what the, the governments will put in place uh, are carbon prices, for example, So um, as we're seeing in construction, uh, there's already sort of um, uh, the the risk of increased costs of uh, procuring construction materials that are high in carbon. So that is the um, sort of incentive for us to then procure um, materials that are are lower in carbon, so it's lower in cost for us. Um, And however, it's it's better for the environment. So um, I think Sort of the the price on carbon will be a will come through and play through maybe not directly but it may be an indirect impact on the supply chain which will drive businesses to, to decarbonize as well thank you amira so tom same question to you what what do you feel will be the biggest driver of decarbonization going forward mm-hmm. yeah so i agree that what's what's already been said definitely going to um come down from from government um while Obviously, the grant scheme is sort of a, an incentive to reduce your your carbon um, your carbon footprint. I think there will be uh, more punitive measures that will come down. There will be things like carbon carbon taxes. Obviously, at the moment there are there are um, taxes on fuel. There's a climate change levy, but there's nothing. There's no huge direct carbon tax sort of across the board. And I think that might be something that that does come down as net zero is in law. It has been legislated legislated for. Um, it is something that the government is going to have to to take action for, um, in order to get to um, to get people to, to decarbonise. I also think that consumer demand is is definitely going to help. Um, people, a lot of businesses are definitely wearing the the net zero um, as a badge of honour, and um, or we're working towards net zero, or having their you know net zero plans laid out and and very open for people to view. So I think that's definitely something that I don't think is going to go away. I don't think people are going to become less um in less uh, have less of a desire for the for the um, companies they're buying from they're working with to to work in those ways so i think that that's definitely going to be a big driver to to help business decarbonize sorry about that um thank you thank you for that um now i've got two more questions we've got about 20 minutes left i've got two more questions for for each of you and then um we've got a couple of of questions from the audience as well so um but before we move on to the the next set of questions um we have our third poll to run i just need to find the question for it the third poll is following this event do you think businesses uh should access grants to decarbonize invest in renewable energy encourage more home working um, and there's a couple of other options as well interestingly for our last poll um, in terms of um, what has your business done to reduce or has your business done anything to reduce its carbon footprint it was pretty much 50 50 between um, we've made lots of changes and we've made some changes which is great so that's that's showing that people are 
taking positive steps forward, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, two more questions from me, and then um, we'll see if we've got any more questions from the, the audience. First question, and I'll start with Amira on this one, is um, I know from my work in the council that behaviour change is the single biggest thing that we can do as a council in order to to combat climate change. So, Amir, what, what hints, tips, suggestions do you have for everybody watching in terms of how they can drive behaviour change within their organisation and also within their industry as well? Um, you, know, you talked about industry bodies earlier on and looking to them and what it is that they're trying to do. We can't just only look to ourselves. We've got to try and influence those around us too. So what are your behaviour change hints and tips? Great question. Um, I'd say the the first thing is sort of identify who are your, like who's going to lead the sustainability or sort of decarbonisation change <clears throat> in your business. Um, and it's probably someone who's already very passionate about it. Um, maybe you're on this call um, or someone who already is very sustainable at home. Um, I think it's, yeah, providing the... Um, the, when I say like infrastructure, I mean sort of the availability to for people to be sustainable and to decarbonise um, on their own. So, for example, some staff engagement policies around um, uh, like recycling. Um, uh, there's some really good ideas around, okay, let's sort of collect all our rubbish after a week and see how good are we at actually recycling and splitting it out. Um, and it's just a really visual representation of, wow, this is how much rubbish we've created in um, one week. Imagine it's this times 52 for a year. Um, some other ideas are um, like switch off policies around laptops and computers. Um, and it's that behavior change that like, you know, switching off that is the, the change that sees uh, reductions in sort of energy usage as well. Um, and there's opportunities for staff engagement around like stair challenges as opposed to using the lift. So, you know, these might sound a bit sort of silly, but actually it's a way to engage your entire business around sustainability. And it doesn't have to be something that um, only particular parts of your business do. Um, you know, there, there probably needs to be someone to lead the initiatives, um, but it is a way to get everyone involved and um, it can be sort of fun as well. Um, in regards to, um, I guess, collaborating or partnering with um, relevant industry associations, certainly looking to, to see what their what their commitments are. Um, and if they don't have any commitments and you're sort of a member of um, an industry association uh, or a membership-based organisation, ask, well, why not? Like, should it be on? It should be on the agenda. Like every other industry and association is is making commitments um, and perhaps supporting their members. Um, I would be challenging, if they do have it on the agenda, challenge them, challenging them to go further. Um, and sort of showing the evidence that this is this is sort of the the issue of the century, and that we need to be prepared and future proof our businesses so we are resilient against uh, shocks and uh, stresses uh, such as COVID um, and such as sort of physical impacts of climate change as well. Thank you, Amira. Now, um, Sarah, the, the same question to you. So behaviour change is clearly a huge thing that we can be doing. So how do you encourage behaviour change throughout the organisations that you work with? Yeah, sure. So I guess at Nesco, we, we sort of live and breathe um, not just renewables, but sustainability in, in general. Our, our mission statement and our values are all based around climate change and meeting net zero. Um, but we we do we frequently work with businesses and investors um, and see a variety of different behavioral patterns. Um, from my perspective, I would say you know, start start small. Uh, don't try to do too much all at once. Um, we we work with multiple different companies who have developed sort of roadmaps, um, looking at you know, what they could do today versus what they could do in, in a couple of years' time or five years' time um, and you know, what are the quick wins and what potentially need more capital investment. 
um, and they can develop their roadmaps that are individual to them and their business. Um, but like I say, you know, Amir has already commented on a couple of the, the, the quick wins that you can do. Um, and I would say these these small things are the steps to, to get you going and, and changing those behavioral patterns. So, you know, turning your, your screens off in the evening or just having a slightly more effective waste management system, all these little things can can have big impacts to the way that people think about things. Um, and then you know, hopefully you'll you'll develop a culture of, of being a bit more proactive rather than than reactive. Um, if we can try and, and sort of get ahead of um, the policies that are likely to come into effect in X number of years time where you are then forced to change. If you are proactively changing your ways and proactively changing the ways of, of the people that work within your business, um, then you will only see the benefits of that in the future. Thank you for that, Sarah. Reminds me of a piece of advice that my father used to give me a lot. He was a bank manager in Scotland, so uh, quite quite tight with money. And um, he always used to say, save for the inevitable. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. We know a lot of these legislation changes are coming. We know what some of the future policies are likely to be. We need to start planning for them now and future-proofing ourselves for them now to make sure that we're not caught off guard in, in five or six years' time and having huge capital outlays in short periods of time when we could have, have planned for it over the coming years and been been ready for it when, when we're able to make the change. Now, Tom... A lot of the, the grants, a lot of the support that your organisation offers helps drive behaviour change in themselves. So, you know, you are, as an organisation, one that, that really is pushing behaviour change in businesses. What advice do you give to people in order to, to help drive that, that lasting, sustainable behaviour change going forward? Yeah, so I think it's definitely about getting um, employees involved and feeling as though it's something that they, they that needs to be um sort of in, in the same sort of way as you think about the bottom line and, and profit and loss obviously at the more extreme end maybe that would be something that with carbon uh, emissions through the year would be something that would be sort of brought about in the same sort of conversation as you would in your profit and loss obviously that that's quite a big shift for a lot of businesses so it may be something at the smaller end as amira mentioned about um having recycling drives and you know, trying to tip the tip it so that the, the the general waste has got less waste in than the um than the recycling does um but also it's it's around trying to help employees understand what, what they are using um and actually something that we're doing in, a, in our um company at the moment is doing our carbon footprint analysis for the year and obviously it's been very different this year because everyone's been working from home but it's also been a good way for us to be able to engage people because now it is a lot of the, it's their energy that they're using so we can put to, we're doing surveys to see how people are using energy at home and then they can actually sort of really look at how they are using energy and and what sort of well for them potentially cost factors are, are involved with that and so that can help to drive uh, behavior going forward um so i i've recent um talk by carbon footprint who are a carbon footprinting footprinting organization said that actually although things like heating will be going up because people will be at home heating their homes working from home commuter mileage reductions will actually mean that um, on average 0.3 of a ton of carbon is saved per employee per year due to working from home um, so that's actually quite a positive thing i suppose that has come out of, of everyone being being stuck in the, in the, in their houses but I think that's a way that we can definitely drive behavioural change going forward is, is making people more aware of what they're doing, how the machinery they're using, the computer they use, the lights they leave on, what sort of energy footprint that has and carbon footprint that has. Thank you, Tom. Now, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, we've gone through quite a few of the questions that have come up from the audience, which is absolutely um, fantastic. Um, one more question from me to, to all of you. Um, so... You know, speaking to, to all of the people in the audience, what one thing do you suggest they do starting tomorrow to have the biggest impact on decarbonisation and you know, reducing their carbon footprint? Uh, and we'll start with Sarah. Sure, I think um, you know, just starting to talk about it more, you know, putting it on, on agendas so that you are actively discussing you know, options that are available to you. Um, and 
I know we've mentioned it already, but again, just touching on those those small actions that you could you could get started with tomorrow. You know, if it's a you know, more waste segregation. I mean, we added an extra bin in our office for um, crisp packets, for example, which is a very quick, easy change. But it's amazing you know, people just automatically switched overnight and started to use it, and it was practically full every day. But um, you know, those those small things can make you know that that huge difference to just changing the way that that people are thinking about this um and yes you know once you start adding it to your agenda and then people start talking about it a bit more you might then you know, figure out who are those core people or key people in your business who are, are really keen to you know, make more of a difference or look at all the different options that you could potentially implement in your business um, and just you know, don't be afraid to explore those different options and, and reach out to, to companies like Anesco or other companies in, in your local area. Um, you know, we are there to help. We are there to help you look at your sustainability agendas and, and help you with you know, options for everything from the small little changes all the way up to you know, looking at, at renewable technologies as well. So, um, yeah, I just say start start thinking about it more and more if you can. Thank you, Sarah. What about you, Amira? What what suggestion would you say for, for everybody to go away and start doing tomorrow? Yeah, I would add to that response and say, um, ask um, your suppliers up or down, um, what are your sustainability commitments and what um, low carbon products or services do you offer? Um, maybe it's on, maybe it's a service they offer that you may not know about, but asking the question and you asking the question is then sort of a trigger reaction from uh, your supply chain of, oh, okay, I'm being asked this question. This is the third time I've had this question, you know, this week, I think we need to develop a more sustainable product or a sustainable service. Um, so it's also engaging your supply chain. Um, and this relates back to uh, Charles Redfern's question about scope three, which is, sort of your supply chain and how can you reduce emissions um, through that. And I think just starting that conversation, asking what products and services are available um, that are more sustainable is is one way to do it too. Wonderful. Thank you, Amira. What about you, Tom? What's your what's your piece of advice to start doing tomorrow? Yeah, um, I agree with what so I think it's all about making um, awareness in, in the organization, in, in the business about what sort of energy usage, carbon impact you're having. If you try to contextualize, for example, energy bills in terms of sales, for example. If, you, if, you're, if, you're, if a business leaves all their lights on overnight and doesn't switch them off in the office, they try and calculate how much energy that's actually costing the year and then put that into a context of this many set this of this many sales made per year and how much time would be, be needed to recuperate that when actually it could only take you know a minute or so just to go around turn the lights off someone's to do that before they leave um it really does start to add up as, as a big cost not only on the environment but on the business bottom line and when they're just wasting wasting energy um, constantly it's really interesting that you say that. I used to work for a company where all of the lights, all of the power sockets and all of the um, printers and photocopiers were on timers. And at six o'clock every night, all of the power went off. And basically the concept was that if you were still in the office after six o'clock, you could use the battery in your laptop but uh, and you could carry on. But for everything else, the power just went off and actually it worked for them. Um, so yeah, quite interesting. Um, interesting comment on um, on the the chat as well from from David, who says home working certainly has reduced his mileage. He was doing twelve thousand miles a year, um, but now he's doing one and a half thousand. So you know, certainly a massive carbon saving as a result of of working from home for him, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, in terms of the, the last survey that we did, the last poll that we did, 63% of people said that um, businesses should be looking to do all of the above, which is access grants for decarbonisation, which is your area, Tom, invest in renewable energy, so your area, Sarah, and encourage a more homeworking, not quite your area there, Amara, but, um, sorry, Amira, um, but, um, you know, I think homeworking is, is something, is a behaviour change that's probably here to stay but I do think there's still going to be a role for, for offices and getting people together because I've certainly missed it.
in terms of our council operations, you know, we've we've missed it as well, getting people together in the way that they they work and, and come together as a result of it. Um, a couple of thoughts from me. So before we, we wrap up, I know we've, we've got a couple of minutes to go. I know there's been some questions for, for Woking Borough Council and, and for me. Tonight isn't about me and it's not about Woking Borough Council. So what we'll do is we will commit to getting answers to all of those questions and sending them out to, to everybody so that everybody can see all of the answers that we've got. In fact, um, we've got a climate emergency newsletter that's going to be starting in the next uh, couple of months. Um, and so there's a link in the chat that you can go to in order to sign up for the Woking Borough Council um, e-newsletters. Uh, e and I would really strongly suggest that everybody does that because I will also commit that in that first um, that first edition of the climate emergency e newsletter, we'll also cover off the answers to all of the questions that people have, have asked in the chat about WBC and, and what it is that we're doing. I think we've had a really interesting conversation this evening, and certainly I've picked up on uh, on quite a lot of things. I just want to very quickly summarise before we go. We've had some really interesting points about you know, deciding who it is that's going to lead the change within within the organisation, about putting policies in place in terms of recycling, about looking at how you go that step further every time you try and do something to do with, with the climate. There's been some really good discussion about how we future proof businesses and how we get ahead of the policies that we know are going to be coming from the government and really planning ahead. Some really good advice in terms of starting small about looking at the things that you can do straight away. They're going to have a big impact on your carbon footprint, but also have a big impact on the engagement within your organisation. So things like recycling and cutting your road miles. There's a really good point about being proactive and really looking ahead keeping this on the agenda, really making it a part of, of meetings going forward. And talking about what can be done and using it as an opportunity to engage teams, to engage your supply chains, um, to engage your industry, and also to engage your customers. I really loved the, the point around you know, what low carbon products or services do you offer to your customers going forward? Because it is going to become more and more um, important to them going forward. And also some really interesting facts that have come out tonight. So solar panels on rooftops have a seven year payback, which is absolutely fantastic. And that's not with the subsidies that you used to get before. It's because the capacity of them is so much greater than they used to be in the past. Switching to low energy lighting and LED can save you 50 to 90 percent on your your lighting bill. Absolutely brilliant. That's something that we could all do very, very quickly. That and switching to low, low cost uh, so green energy tariffs. Um, as well. I really liked the concept of crowdsourcing of ideas. It's something that we at Working Borough Council did right after we declared a climate emergency. We went to our residents and we asked them, what do you want us to do? And in amongst a lot of people suggesting planting more trees, um, we had some really great ideas that have gone into to educating our, our carbon emergency action plan. And I really would suggest to everybody, you know, engage your staff, engage your industry, engage your suppliers and engage your customers in what it is that, that you can do and how you can cut that carbon footprint. And also, I think the big story or big piece of news from me is that finances do make the carbon decarbonisation agenda difficult particularly at the moment in, in the COVID times. But there is support available. There are grants available. There's more and more grants becoming available every day from the government and from other organisations. And that's absolutely fantastic. And there's a lot of advice and there's a lot of expertise that's out there and is available that you can tap into. Um, you know, And if you want some ideas of who it is you can speak to, you can come to us as a council and we'll point you in the direction of the people that we know. But you've had three fantastic experts here tonight, free of charge, giving you their advice, giving you their time to talk about what you could do and, and hopefully inspire you a little bit. Before we go, I want to thank everybody for giving up the, your Tuesday night for coming along and listening to this. Um, we really do appreciate it and I really do appreciate everybody taking the steps that you already have done um, on, your, on your carbon journey and your decarbonisation journey. Um, I want to thank Tom and Sarah and Amira for, for giving up their time, for coming along and talking and really engaging in what it is that we're trying to do, for answering our questions so honestly and, and hopefully answering some of your questions um, as well. 
I'd like to thank the WBC officers for, for organising this and giving up their, their evening as well to help facilitate it, to constantly feed me messages on, on the private chat that we've got going on so that I know exactly what it is that I'm meant to be saying and asking um, and helping me look uh, professional, hopefully. Um, please do sign up for that, that newsletter. We'd love to have your feedback on tonight as well. You can email climate.emergency at wokingham.gov.uk like I said right at the very beginning, this is hopefully the first of a series of many climate conversations going forward that will cover not just business, but also schools and education, people and, and what you can do in your own homes, charities and all other areas of that, that fall within Wokingham Borough Council and, and make Wokingham Borough the, the borough that it is. Um, and with that, I will say thank you to each and every one of you. Another great big thank you from me to Tom, Sarah and, and Amira really do appreciate your time your expertise um and, and what you've what you've given us tonight thank you very much for everybody for coming and good night i hope you have a good one